Now I can save my voice a little bit. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 7. A story that you may have forgotten. It's kind of a little bit obscure, but Tony figured it out on that song in 2006. If you look at your bulletin, I like to find different uh, art from the Middle Ages and different times. And people have depicted biblical events. But you know who that is on your bulletin? That's John the Baptist. That's supposed to be an artist's redemption of him. Uh, languishing in prison. John the Baptist was one of the greatest prophets of old. He was one of the greatest prophets. Some would call him an Old Testament prophet. And you say, well, he was in the New Testament, but yet he prophesied under the Old Covenant. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets who was preparing the way for Jesus. John the Baptist was a mighty man. He was a great man. Jesus himself spoke of the greatness of John the Baptist. And John found himself in a prison cell because he had spoken out against power. He had spoken up against Herod Antipas for his sin and his adultery. And as a result, he was facing execution in a dungeon. I want to speak to you about that time that John spent in prison and some of the things that he experienced. The title of this sermon that I call today, and I hope it speaks to you because I think we've all asked these questions before. Jesus, who are you really? <laughs> Jesus, where are you? Jesus, I don't see anything happening. Have you ever been disappointed with God? Have you ever been disappointed with what you see God has done in your life? Let's read the scripture and ask God to eliminate this to our hearts today. Luke chapter 7, verse 18 begins like this. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. I want to stop right there. We may have a little bit more scripture to deal with as time permits, but this is the main passage today, and this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Oh, your word. Oh, it just permeates my heart right now. Lord, I've studied and I've, I've researched, but Lord, even now you're revealing new truths to me as I read it once again with my dear friends here at church. Lord, give us revelation and utterance. Give us supernatural impartation and knowledge, God, that only the Holy Spirit can give because we're, we're just not able to comprehend it without it, Lord. Lord, let us have it so simple that a child could understand. I thank you, Lord, for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, the very essence, the very heart of this passage that speaks to me as God related to my heart. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And following him will often be fraught with controversy and difficulty. It ain't going to be easy. Be forewarned when you come to Jesus, oh, it's new life. Oh, it's joy. Oh, it's peace. Oh, he will make you very happy. But Jesus also said, we got to count the cost. There is a cost to following Jesus. It's like the old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. It may be getting lonely. It may get lonely. It may get dark. You may feel like you're the only one sometimes, and you may receive persecution because you ain't going to be popular in this world. You're never going to fit in to the world system because the devil's the head of the world system. He'll have you compromise and break off a piece here and mold yourself in the shape of the world and you'll fit in just fine. But when you stand on the rock of ages, on the scriptures, you're going to be going head on into the world. You're going to be button heads with the devil and all of his crowd. So be forewarned, it ain't always easy. It is, however, the greatest and highest and most consequential journey of our lives, dear friends. 
It has great, great consequences. It is the journey that we embark on. So I want to ask you this question, and I'll ask you throughout the passage and throughout the sermon today. Who do you say that he is? Who is he really? Who is Jesus? Is he a religious icon? Is he an exalted philosopher? Is he uh, take a seat right along with all the other great ones like the Buddha and, and Muhammad and Confucius and all those who have written such platitudes and told people how to live their lives? Or is Jesus something, someone entirely different? Jesus, dear friends, we know it. You guys know it as well as I do. He's a dividing line. He is that dividing line that goes right through humanity. You believe him or you reject him. He's a lightning rod of controversy because he makes radical claims. He claims to be exclusive. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. He said, I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Jesus is not talking about just breaking up families. He's not talking about stirring up strife. He says his very word, his very existence, his very exclusivity will separate people one from another. People will argue, people will break fellowship with one another. We know that today, our Orthodox Jews, if a person in their family gets saved, they call them dead. They're dead to me. Same with Muslims. If a devout Muslim has a one of their household who receives Jesus as their Savior, they are completely divorced from their family. That's what Jesus is talking about. This is radical. This is not just some mental assent that we give or a religion that we follow or everybody needs to go to church and church is good and it's everybody needs to go. This is radical. Following Jesus is a dividing line. The world's, the world's solution is to give him lip service. Acknowledge his presence in history as a great teacher, respect as a religious icon, a wonderful example, but Jesus said this is going to cost. Luke 14, 28-33 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is speaking in hyperbole about hating your mother, hating your, your people around you. He doesn't mean that we, we were ill-tempered and arbitrary and hard to get along with and that we're dividing our households. What he's saying is, who's number one? Who's number one? There's going to be a time when you may have to go against your relatives to be able to follow the call of God on your life. There may come a time when you have to go against those who otherwise love you, those that you surround yourself with. You may have to take the opposite path and it's going to cause break, break up and fissures and, and fractions with, within you. Ask you this question again. Who do you say that he is? It's so important. Who do you say that he is? I want you to know. This may shock some of you that I say this. Doubt. Doubt is part of our journey. Doubt is part of our journey and the devil wants to turn that on you when you have some sort of doubts or when you have a time when you're asking Jesus, Lord, I need to see you. I need a revelation of who you are because I'm starting to doubt. The darkness is starting to consume me. The devil wants to say, see there, you didn't believe all along. You never were a Christian. I told you you weren't a Christian. You, 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 you just, you've just blown it. You just need to come on and, and forget about all that stuff. That's the way the devil sneaks into our lives. He comes to tell us that there is no Jesus. There is no plan for your life. And now you're beginning to mature and see that. And you need to just drop all that. But doubt, dear friends, is not a curse. Doubt is part of our journey. Every one of us will experience it. I believe with all my heart. Boy, have I. And I'm the preacher. I tell you what, I hope you all don't fire me. But I have experienced bouts of doubt in my life. Times of darkness when I said, Jesus, I really need to hear from you. I haven't heard anything in a while. Are you, are, are you there? Are you going to do what you said you would do, Lord? I'm out here. I'm out here on the water and I can't swim very good. Help me, Jesus. The doubt begins to take us over. But the truth is, it's circumstances. Circumstances bear hard on us. Our expectations are challenged when things don't go as like we thought they should. Like we had it all planned. Oh, I was going to walk with Jesus. I was going to be happy. I was going to leave my family and I'm going to have, make plenty of money and I'm going to always have uh, the path before me because he has said I could have an abundant life and, and things are going to go well. People are going to love me. 
I'm going to go into the ministry and he's going to give me a big church and he's going to give me all that I ever dreamed of and I'll be playing golf every week with rich people and I'll be preaching the gospel on Sunday. That's the illusion that some people have. They believe that everything is going to come up roses. But when our faith is tested, things can change. Our minds begin to question and look for a safety net. Rest assured, Jesus is not a bit threatened by your doubt. It doesn't bum him out. It doesn't cause him to say, well, I'm not going to talk to him anymore. It doesn't cause him to divorce you. It doesn't cause him to not love you anymore. He just wants to embrace you, but he wants to give you his long-term perspective. That's the problem is our perspective. When our faith is tested, things can change. So I'm going to tell you today, before I go any further, bring those doubts to Jesus. He can handle it. Place your doubts on his word. Line them up. Line them up against the promises of God. Read what he says, not what you think it says or what you think it ought to say. That's the problem. Nowadays, people are trying to rewrite scripture to say what we think it ought to say according to our modern sensibility and according to our woke culture. But dear friends, the word of God is eternal. Uh, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The word of God will not change. We will break ourselves against it if we ignore it. Jesus can handle every doubt you have. You'll only allow him. Give it to him. Give it to him and he will show you. Number one, I've got some points here. We're going to try to track ourselves in the bulletin today so we don't run rabbits. And we will talk about these as they come. Following Jesus will not be easy. I believe I've already covered that one. Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Think about this. Jesus said, take up a cross. That was months or maybe a year or two before he was crucified. Now, when we think about taking up the cross, we think about Jesus holding that cross. When climbing Mount Golgotha with that uh, beaten, severely beaten, savagely toting the cross, it probably weighed over 100, 150 pounds, being treated like the worst kind of animal, and he was carrying the cross. But he was speaking now to a people who had watched many, many criminals carry that cross. It was a custom of Rome, a cruel, cruel method of execution. And he said, you gotta take up that cross, that burden. Oh, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be tough at times. It's not gonna be a cakewalk. It's not gonna be easy because you're gonna to have to give up something. You're gonna to have to give up your own ambition. You're gonna to have to give up your own desires. Your own uh, rosy way of thinking of how things ought to turn out, like I was just talking about. These ideals that we have that life is just supposed to be this way. You've got to give that up for him. He says, I'm going to give you abundant life. But dear friends, give it to me. Let me give you life. John, John 15, 18 through 21 says, Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. They hate you because you love Jesus. They hate Jesus. It's about Jesus. The world system hates Jesus and you love Jesus, so therefore you are the natural born enemy. As a child of God, you will never be a part of mainstream society. You do not fit in, nor will you ever. Shattered expectations produce doubts. Let's take a look at our expectations. Where do they come from? Are they real? Some grand story or just a pipe dream? Some people ask, why is my life in such a mess? Others around me seem to be unaffected. Have you ever looked around and said, Lord, I'm in terrible shape. Why are everybody else around me prospering? Lord, new cars, good jobs, big houses, and I struggle to pay my water bill. I don't know what I'm doing, Lord. I've done everything I can to serve you. Why is everybody else in such better shape than me? That produces doubt in my heart because it's a warped sense of expectation and warped sense of entitlement. If Jesus is who he says he is, if he is watching my life, if he loves me, why am I suffering so? John the Baptist, the greatest prophet of all, chosen to prepare the way for Jesus. What a holy calling in advance. He is now shaken with doubt. Oh, he's languishing in this dark, dank prison cell because he spoke out against sin, the thing he was called to do. He was a hard-nosed prophet and he wasn't afraid of anything. He was a loner who lived out in the desert by himself and he ate locust and honey and he wore animal skins and he would call out the Pharisees, called them a brood of vipers. 
He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the Holy Spirit began to change hearts and people began to come to the River Jordan and he would baptize them as disciples of John. Pre-Jesus, as disciples of John, their hearts were ready for Jesus. Their hearts were ready to repent. He was baptizing them unto repentance, the hard-nosed prophet. He was a character. He didn't care what people thought about him. But for all of his toughness, Oh, for all of his ruggedness, John was a human being. Deep inside there was a heart. He began to hurt. He began to doubt. And the devil began to attack him. His captors had shut him off from all of his disciples, all of his people. And as he languished, his mind began to work. Oh, when we have downtime, doesn't our mind begin to work? When we lay down and can't go to sleep immediately at night, our mind goes to work. And we hear the voice of the Lord. And sometimes we hear the voice of the devil. We hear the devil say, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is not even real. Uh, Jesus has not touched your life in a long time. You see where you're lacking. How much does he love you? Look at what everyone else has. Have you heard those things? Is it just me? Oh, I take authority over it in Jesus' name because I'm not going to listen to the devil tell me what I need in my life. I'm not going to listen to the devil tell me what the plan for the future is. Jesus has said that he has come that I might have life and have it more abundantly. The enemy has come to kill me, to steal from me, and to destroy me. I want to have nothing to do with him, dear friends. He said, I know the plans I have for you back in the book of Jeremiah, way back in the Old Testament. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. A future. Not the future that you may conjure in your mind because of what you see around you. The future that comes on CNN or Fox News or Netflix or the newspaper. Whatever we're receiving in the culture. But the future that he has for me, which cannot be beat. The greatest future that I can have is the future that Jesus has for me. So Jesus understands where we're at. He understands doubt. Jesus understands doubt and he's willing to touch our hearts we bring that doubt to him. Listen to this. Oh, so important. Number three, Jesus is the only way. You hear me say it almost every Sunday probably, but I don't think we can say it enough, particularly in this culture, particularly in this time when there is what we call a syncretistic view of religion, a syncretistic view of the world, that all religions are valid, that everyone has their own God, and as long as they're sincere, as long as they treat their fellow man well, that everyone is under some sort of a big tent, that everyone will go to heaven. It doesn't matter about the name of Jesus specifically because everyone has their own God. I know a few years ago, I may have told you this story, but a school bus, as a school bus driver, I used to drive field trips a lot. There's a social studies teacher over at Oconee Middle School who would like to take her classes to the Hindu temple that's down in Lilburn, Georgia. Big, beautiful place, handcrafted with marble that had been shipped from India, carved, hand carved. It took years and millions and millions of dollars to put this place together. And it is something to see. It's all inspiring, but just the sheer craftsmanship of it. Well, we went down there and a group of school kids, it was about learning, it was about culture, it was about history and social studies, and it was a valid learning experience. And as we went there, I met the sweetest, kindest people. Oh, they were precious. They had up posters on their walls and, and decorations talking about collecting food for people in the community. I'm talking about doing good work, the same kind of stuff that we would do as a church. Oh, they're precious and they were so kind and they invited us in and I felt a sense of, of very much being treated like a special guest. It was beautiful. And they talked about their religion and I saw their gods all in these little glass cases. It was the various incarnations of God. There was probably, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them. And the people who were in service to those gods, the Hindu monks, if you will, were dressed in robes. They would take fruit bowls and place it in front of those idols. Idols, that's what it was. It was idolatry, just like from the Old Testament. And it gave my spirit pause because I realized what I was seeing was worship of false gods right before me. But they were so sweet and they were so kind. And I could tell myself a thousand times that, oh, these people have the right heart and their spirit is good and they love one another. But dear friends, it's not enough. They say we love Jesus. There was a, a, a statue of Jesus there as well among all the false gods. He was simply another God on the shelf, simply another religious icon. But dear friends, that 
does not square with Scripture. It does not square with Jesus' only word. John 14, 10. You know it. I quote it all the time. I am the way. Not a way. Not some way. Not partially a way. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Oh, it's sad. Oh, it breaks my heart to think that those precious Hindu people are deceived. But they are deceived. Precious Muslim people that I have met, not all Muslims are terrorists, dear friends. I've known many Muslims who are some of the finest, sweetest, and kindest people I've ever met. But oh, dear friend, they're deceived. They believe Jesus was a prophet. They believe that he was along the lines of Muhammad and others, Muhammad being their greatest prophet. Oh, and they like Jesus. They love him in a certain way, but they do not worship him as God. They do not believe he is the only way. Jesus said, this is a dividing line. This is a dividing line. One of my dear preachers that I love to listen to, he passed away a few years ago, Dr. R.C. Sproul, preached on this. And he said, if there are many ways to God, then it's very likely that Jesus is not one of them. So dear friends, it's exclusive. If you believe that, if you believe that there are many ways to God, then Jesus is not in there. Simply because he said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you think that God is stingy and lacking in grace by restricting it to one way and one way only, you need to ask yourself, why is there any way? Why is there any way? That was another quote from Dr. Sproul. If you believe that, there, that God is just being stingy and that God has this real narrow way, which he does, Jesus is not involved in that. You go your way. You trust your false gods. Dear friends, Jesus is the only way. It's a dividing line. It's a dividing line. I've heard somebody say, what would it, what would it take? What would it take for Jesus to reveal himself to you? I heard a man say, I've heard more than one person say, but one man in particular I think of, I just need him to come down here and show himself to me. I just need him to come show himself to me. Well, dear friends, if you've ignored the works of his hands, if you've ignored everything he's done in your life, if you've ignored the call of God on your life, and you demand a sign, Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, this adulterous and wicked generation will not be given a sign except for the sign of Jonah, that in the belly of the whale, three days and three nights, he said, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days. He said, my resurrection will be the sign that I will rise again and that I will return to my Father and my word will be fulfilled. And dear friends, it has been fulfilled now for 2,000 years and it will continue to be fulfilled because we're going to see him again very, very soon when he comes in the clouds and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain, we shall be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm going to get happy here in just a minute. I might dance all the way down the aisle. Would that make y'all leave? I hope not. Jesus is real and Jesus has plans for us. Jesus uniquely fulfills all truth. Jesus fulfilled every Passover, every Feast of Trumpets, everything from the Old Testament, all those beautiful feasts and festivals that God had his people perform as a sign, as a projection to say that coming in the coming decades, in the coming centuries, in the coming millennia, I'm going to have my son to come to this earth to fulfill all truth. Jesus' life and message uniquely fulfill all the truth. Luke chapter 4, we talked about it just a few weeks ago. Jesus came to the synagogue and he began to read from the scroll and he began to speak and he, he not just implied, he stated, I am fulfilling this prophecy here today in your midst. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Oh, dear friends, Jesus came to preach the good news of the gospel. He is the gospel. He's the very essence of the gospel, the object of the gospel, the object of our salvation. Jesus saves. Jesus heals. Jesus delivers. And Jesus is coming again. Glory to his name. At that very time, the Bible says, he cured people. At that very time, those two disciples of John came up to him in the midst of a healing time. He was healing people right and left, and here they come. And they said, John wants to know, Jesus, are you the one? Are you the one, or should we look for someone else? 
Oh, John was having his question answered if he could only see it. He's in prison, but his men saw it there. And Jesus said, look around you, my dear friend. Look around you. I want to read that again. He said, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised in the good news. The gospel. The good news. The euangelion in Greek. The gospel is being preached to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. I'll talk a little bit about that stumbling block. I think we're going to be wrapping up here in just a couple of moments. Following Jesus is not easy. Jesus understands doubt. Jesus is the only way. Jesus' life fulfills all truth. But Jesus' message is going to be offensive to a certain amount of people. To many people, he said, blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me. This goes way back in prophecy. David prophesied in the Psalms in Psalm 118. He said, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is for the Lord, and this is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The cornerstone. We talked about foundations last week. I know we talked about building and talked about the house with the foundations on the rock, and the bedrock is the one that will withstand the storms of life. And we talked about the very concept of a cornerstone. The cornerstone is part of the foundation, and it's a, it may be a more of an ancient building trade, but it was a really interesting process where someone could make an absolutely perfectly square foundation. They didn't have the tools we have. They didn't have the modern technology that we have, but they would set that cornerstone, and the entire building would be built around that cornerstone being absolutely perfect. The ancient prophets and David spoke and said, Jesus is the cornerstone. He was the stone that the builders rejected. He goes back to Isaiah 28, 16. Isaiah says, so this is what the Lord God says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will never be shaken. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus spoke himself and said, speaking of himself as the cornerstone, have you never read in scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's quoting David there. He said, therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, speaking to the Jews, the Pharisees, and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. A beautiful song that I love so much says, a stone that makes men stumble a rock that makes him fall. Many will be broken so that he can make them whole and many will be crushed and lose their own soul. It's a, it's a hard fact of history, of the scriptures, but Jesus is the cornerstone and he will offend many. The very notion of exclusivity, the very notion that there is no other way to God other than Jesus, it offends certain people who will not bow their knee to him. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Finally, in the end, Jesus affirms John the Baptist. He tells those folks, and I'm going to summarize the rest of the chapter here because it goes on and the disciples are standing there with him and some others are listening in and, and those disciples leave to go back and tell John that Jesus said he is the one. He fulfills Isaiah 61. We saw it ourselves, John, that he's healing people right and left. The evil spirits are leaving. He is the one. But Jesus told those all around, unless they think that John was a doubter. You know, we're so bad about labeling people. We call Thomas to this day, people call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas was one of the greatest apostles who ever lived, one of the greatest evangelists. I love Thomas. But we still call him Doubting Thomas. If Jesus hadn't said this, we might still be saying Doubting John. Oh, John was weak in his faith. He wasn't much of a prophet. But Jesus said, wait a minute. John, there is no man born of women like John the Baptist. He said he is a prophet. He is a prophet, the, one of the greatest prophets of old. And Jesus spoke so highly of him. And he told his friends and he told everyone who was listening that John is strong. John is a prophet and Jesus affirms him. John had not just been some flash in the pan. He was the real deal. Luke chapter 7, when they heard this, all the people, even the tax collectors, they agreed that God's way was right. 
For they had been baptized by John. He had been baptized in sinners for a long time. There were some ex-tax collectors and maybe some current tax collectors who had repented of their sins. And John had baptized them. They heard this, but the Pharisees, hardcore religious people, experts in religious law, they rejected God's plan for them. But they had refused John's baptism. Who do they say that he is? It's the dividing line. It's the scandal. Now as we begin to close with the concluding thoughts, I want you to understand as we walk away today, doubt is normal. Don't feel condemned if you doubt. Take it to Jesus. Take your doubt to Jesus. He'll help. He turned my mind around many, many times. He said, you're just looking at the wrong thing, son. You're looking at the wrong perspective. I'm looking right here in my perspective. I'm not able to see what he sees. His doubt, his doubt comes to Jesus and he will take it and face it square on, head on. Number two, bring it to your brothers and sisters in Christ. you got a pastor. I'm right here. My numbers are in the bulletin. I'll come up here to church. I'll come to your house. We'll go get coffee. We'll do something. We'll sit and talk for hours, however long it takes. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to Jesus. I'm going to talk to you about his word. I'm going to share my heart. I'll share about how he took care of my doubts. If you got doubts, tell somebody. It doesn't have to be me. I'm not the only one in here who can handle doubt. Look around you. Look around right now. You're looking at your family. This is your family, folks. This is your family. Bring those doubts to someone who loves you. We've all been there. It's part of building up the body of Christ. Number three, understand that he is in process of making you holy. I said process. I got a ways to go yet. Now, I'm better than I was last week. I'm better than I was last year because I'm walking with him. I'm asking him to change me daily, but boy, do I still have some rough edges. He's knocking those off just as quick as I'll let him. And as long as I walk with him, he's going to continue that process and it's going to complete one day when I see him face to face. It ain't going to complete until then. I'm going to have some rough edges. Understand he's in process of making you holy. Every single day you live is an opportunity. He's showing himself strong in your life. If you just listen, listen more than you talk. So many times we sit down to pray and we say, Oh Lord, help me Lord, help me Lord. I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, Lord, I need this, I need that. Pay my bills, Lord. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. You just need to get quiet. Just listen. Say, Lord, I love you, Jesus. Jesus, you've been so good. Listen. Listen to the Lord. He's in the process of making you whole. Number four and final. Jesus is exclusive. He is the only way to God and to heaven. Any notion of an alternative path, by definition, will exclude Jesus. You can't have it both ways. Well, Jesus is my way, but maybe not your way. No, no. He's either the way or he's no way. No way at all. We discount him or we fully accept him. That's the only opportunity we have. That's the only, only thing we have. C.S. Lewis said he's either a liar, he's either a lunatic, or he is Lord. That's the three options we have available to us. He's a crazy man. He was a lying devil from hell. He is Lord of all. Who do you say that He is? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Oh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Like Peter said that day when you were speaking to the disciples and said, Who do the men say that I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And He said, You said, Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven, upon this rock, I'll build my church. On oh, this very fact, this bedrock fact, you are the Son of the living God, the Christ, the Anointed One. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, we worship you. Lord, when we have doubts, when we have fears, oh, God, I want to bring them to you. I want to bring them to you. They don't threaten you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dealing with us so tenderly, so tenderly because you love us. We're your children. Lord, you're not trying to beat us up. You're not trying to ruin us. You're not trying to catch us in something. You love us. You gave everything so that we could have life and so that we could be successful, Lord, so that we could see you one day holy and blameless before the Father. Bless you, Lord. Thank you for my dear friends today, Lord. I pray that we would seek you with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our mind, and all of our strength. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to speak to the internet audience today and tell you that we love you. Jesus is Lord. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, today is the day. Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Be saved today. Reach out to Him. Ask Him to forgive your sins. Ask Him to come into your life. 
Be saved today, dear friend. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants you to be successful. Jesus wants you to be part of His heart. Come now. Come now to Jesus. Yes, Lord. Dangerous toils and snares I have already come. Take number 572. Amen. I want you to say, say hello to somebody on the internet with me. I believe Cindy Wang is probably watching from China. She's in China for the summer. Wow. So y'all say hey to Cindy. Hey Cindy. Hey Cindy. We love you, Cindy. We hope you're watching. We love you, and we'll see you soon when you get back from China, maybe at the end of the summer. Wow. God bless you all. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. Go enjoy fellowship with one another. You don't know Lester today, right? Uh, I, I think